Well, welcome everyone. And um, thanks to, for joining this side event of the Protection of Civilian Week uh, in person. This is good to be together as a community. Um, today we'll be discuss discussing and exploring together the, the topic of uh, how protection efforts and the local level are driving humanitarian access. Um, and with the aim of scaling up the impact of our principled humanitarian action. So a very contempor contemporary uh, topic and, um, and progressive topic in many ways. So I'd like to thank the, the co-sponsors and the organizers for the event um, to make it possible. So um, we have the, the permanent missions of Norway, Belgium, and France as our co-sponsors, and um, for the organizers, the Global Protection Cluster, the Center of Competence on Humanitarian Negotiations, OCHA, UNHCR, and UNICEF. Um, the format of the session today, we will, um, we will first uh, hear uh, some opening remarks, and, uh, and then we will hear uh, a number of speakers um, from different organizations uh, to give us really the landscape and their experience. And following their remarks, I will uh, open the floor for uh, interventions from um, participants in the room. Uh, I'm very sorry for those who join us online that we won't be able to take your questions, but we appreciate really your participation today. And, um, and uh, I, will, um, I will give the floor to a few, to a few uh, speakers or interventions, and, and we'll hear back from, from the panel if uh, they want to react or respond to your questions. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll have some uh, wrap-up conclusive remarks uh, from the, uh, our chief uh, global protection cluster. And, uh, and this is it for today. So a bit more than one and a half hour almost for us today is great. And um, so without further ado, I will introduce uh, the speakers. Um, we, have, uh, we will start with uh, Ambassador Mona Jul from uh, the permanent mission of, uh, of Norway. Um, for the opening remarks and sharing some views on Norway's priorities with regard to protection and access. Um, then uh, Ms. Louise Aubin, uh, from the resident coordinator in Niger, will share with us the perspectives and experience with humanitarian partners in Niger and building also on uh, her humanitarian leadership, supporting uh, the strengthening of access and protection of civilians. Uh, we'll then move to uh, our panelists, um, and first, we will have online Mr. Usama Shurbagi, the general manager of um, AFAC Academy, um, operating in northwest Syria, um, and, uh, and who will join us to share about the actual negotiations and engagement in support for protection on the ground. Um, we will then hear from uh, Mr. Rehan Zahid, uh, who is acting director of the Center for Huma of Competence on Humanitarian Negotiations and based in Geneva, um, who works on strengthening the ne negotiation uh, skills and capacities with humanitarian and protection actors uh, globally. Um, then we will hear from Arnaud uh, Royer, I hope I pronounced properly, the head of OHCHR and the protection cluster lead in Haiti, also joining us uh, online to share some insight from the work um, he and the partners in the in the protection cluster in Haiti um, mm -hmm. are undertaking engaging with uh, various armed groups and um, and then uh, Aurélien Buffler Buffley, Buffley <laughs> from the chief of OCHA policy advice and planning section here in New York who will share more with regards to OCHA's priorities approaches as lead agency within the, the UN system and the humanitarian architecture on humanitarian access. And after that, I will open for interventions and uh, we will hear the concluding remark from uh, Samuel Chung, who is uh, the coordinator of the Global Protection Cluster and supporting 31 protection clusters at the country level that will give us a good overview. This is our program for today. So without further ado, over to you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ségolène, and uh, to UNICEF for really setting the scene for this very important discussion here this afternoon. 
Protection of civilians is at the heart of Norway's humanitarian strategy. It is therefore a great pleasure for me to co-host this event. And I would like to thank the Global Protection Cluster for all your efforts in organizing this meeting, as well as our co-hosts. And particular thanks to our speakers from Syria, Haiti, and Myanmar. As we are sitting here, more than 110 armed conflicts around the world are dramatically affecting the lives of millions of civilians. It is telling that the number of armed groups has exploded, including those evolving into de facto authorities. And we are very concerned that in several regions, protracted armed conflicts and complex humanitarian emergency are becoming the norm rather than the exception. As the nature of the conflicts become more complex and even confusing, we strongly believe that it is important to uphold the humanitarian principles. And we believe it is important to speak with all actors in a conflict, even with those we disapprove of, to secure access. In the absence of centralized governance and control, we see that more and more access negotiations are taking place at local levels. This makes it even more important to act on the promises from the 2016 World Humanitarian Summit to increase the support to actors at local levels. Local efforts are often being done on or near the front lines in high-risk operating environments. These efforts are having critical, tangible impacts, such as enabling civilians to access medical clinics, ensuring entry of humanitarian assistance into besieged villages, or facilitating safe passage of school children through checkpoints. But local actors often do not get the needed support and investment. This includes needed acceptance in terms of the role that humanitarian actors have in engaging and negotiating with parties to the conflict. And it includes the investment that enables them to develop needed re relationship and trust, both with state and non-state armed groups and communities, to be responsive and flexible while at the same time ensuring proper risk management of staff, not least to be able to stay and deliver for as long as, as needs remain. The discussion here today is an opportunity to further unpack the different roles being played by protection actors, including local and national partners, and to look at how we, as the international community, can more effectively partner with and invest in efforts at local levels. At the global level, we believe that the centrality of protection must become a reality in the humanitarian sector as a whole. One action we can take is to support the implementation of the recommendation from the IISC Protection Review. Norway also supports the renewed engagement by the ERC and OCHA to strengthen its overall effort on humanitarian negotiations. We need more sustained assistance and protection services and long-term engagement with communities, even in the most remote areas. At the local level, Wherever possible, international engagement should support the protection efforts by local and national actors. We firmly believe that the people affected by crisis need to be at the center of the response. Humanitarian action should be as local as possible and as international as necessary to ensure that people in need receive proper assistance and protection. As for Norway, Important funding channels to local and national responders are the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement, Norwegian Strategic Humanitarian Partners, and the UN Country-Based Pooled Funds. Protection will be a main 
priority when Norway soon takes over the co-chairmanship of the pooled fund working group. Next month, Norway will be hosting the international conference Protecting Children in Armed Conflict, together with Save the Children, UNICEF, ICRC, and in cooperation with the, with the Special Advisor for Children in Armed Conflict, the African Union, and OCHA. So we are calling for a strong political engagement and commitment from all stakeholders. Coming to an end, I would like to stress that even though the operational environment is complex, humanitarian needs are record high and the level of funding is low, we must not lose sight of what we actually managed to achieve. Every day, millions of people in, in need enjoy some level of humanitarian protection. That is thanks to the incredible efforts by the humanitarian community, and not least, local actors. So I hope that the discussion here today will contribute to spark hope and motivation to further support local level protection support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Ambassador. I um, thank you for outlining also the, the actual commitments and actions Oslo uh, Norway is taking um, for the, in that endeavor. Uh, I note in particular your, your words about the importance of partnership and of investment, not only financially, but investing in trust, investing in relationship, uh, investing in risk management, which are non-monetary investments, but nonetheless, uh, critical to make a difference yeah. on that agenda. So I'd um, like to uh, welcome again Ms. Uh, Louise Aubin, our UN resident coordinator in Niger, um, and who brings also a huge uh, experience in humanitarian leadership role, including serving as a regional representative of uh, UNHCR, Deputy Director of International Protection, and, um, and now as, as resident coordinator in, uh, in Niger, you are leading our humanitarian response um, in a context that where access to protection is it's a significantly constrained um, and as in any conflict situation, highly politicized, I suppose, the civilians are bearing the brunt of um, humanitarian consequences of the situation. So what is your experience uh, leading and supporting access and principled humanitarian action in, uh, in Niger? What are the approaches you've seen um, in terms of protection uh, and humanitarian actors taking um, these, uh, such efforts forward? And uh, maybe also what are the main challenges you see? Over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Madam Ambassador, um, Madam Moderator, colleagues, panelists, uh, our fearless leader, the DVC coordinator, dear ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here. You, you thanked the organizers of the event uh, by naming them, but I, I do want to underscore just how important it is to create space to be able to talk about this. And in particular, um, and this is my new hat, my, my new hat, my, my, my dedicated hat, which is the resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator of a country I've grown to um, um, highly, not just appreciate, but admire. And I want to spend the full time allotted to me to be able to talk about, uh, to talk about Niger. I've chosen three lessons. I call them lessons. Three, three um, sets of observations I wanted to share with you about the dimensions of humanitarian access and, and protection as we lived them and worked through them in, in Niger. And I've chosen um, three, mm, call them tension points, um, that we're still um, working on. The first lesson, um, and I think this is um, particularly significant for people who've been to Niger and for some time, uh, building on Niger's own tradition of dialogue. There's a wise saying in Niger that goes something like this, Repel the enemy with a sword, he is bound to come back. Repel the enemy with truth, and he will always stay away. And in its fight against armed groups, whether in the tri-border area that Niger shares with uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, or in the Lake Chad region on the border with um, Nigeria, Niger has consistently reminded international partners and neighbors 
that a military approach alone will not suffice to vanquish the Boko Haram's, the Al-Qaeda's, or Islamic State-linked armed groups, which prey on communities struggling with unresolved social grievances, political exclusion, and uh, economic deprivation. Communities, particularly in border areas, are the real rampart in the conflict. They navigate between, on the one hand, non-state armed groups' threats, violence, and extorted offer of protection. And on the other hand, the state, often absent in the way it is most needed. I mean, with all of its attributes, dispensing fair justice, making available basic social services, and enabling conditions for livelihoods. Yes, Niger has the dubious honor of having uh, one of the highest demographic rates in the world, while ranking near the bottom of the Human Development Index. And with levels of insecurity at its borders, the stakes could not be higher, nor more pressing to respond to what people need from their government. And so accelerating inclusive development at a local level while reestablishing the state's presence and role is the best bet for a securitized effort to have a lasting impact. Social and political dialogue is a long-standing and central feature of Niger's multi-ethnic identity and how it's negotiated stability so far. In fact, national institutions are dedicated to ensuring inclusive and peaceful dialogue. A notable example stemming from the peace agreements after the Tuareg rebellions is the Haute Autorité à la Consolidation de la Paix, or the Peace Consolidation Authority which is active across the whole country, catalyzing intercommunal dialogues through quick impact projects designed by communities and through peaceful coexistence agreements concluded by communities themselves, Beni Bangu being the most recent um, significant effort. The UN and partners and country contribute to this balanced strategy that Niger pursues and which relies heavily on communities' participation. The UN's newly adopted Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework aims to increase human security and quality of life, leveraging programs of stabilization, peace building, and durable solutions to forced displacement, specifically in insecure and isolated border areas where fear, hunger, and displacement are most sharply felt. The determination of such areas of convergence to focus UN mandates, NGO experience, and local partnerships were the result of a year-long joined-up country analysis with government, including community-level consultations. Lesson number two, negotiating alternatives to safeguard the security of humanitarians. Access in Niger is challenging in normal circumstances. Poor road infrastructure, regular flooding, and sheer distances make humanitarian actors reliant on the only air alternative that is UNHAS, the UN Humanitarian Air Service. And you'll forgive me here to plug you, UNHAS, because I'm in a room full of potential donors that should be engaged. We need more predictable, longer-term funding for this essential air service in, in Niger. But access has, in the past years, become more challenging, given the volatility of insecurity. Following the tragic killing of a non -state armed group, by a non-state armed group of foreign aid workers in the Kure Park in August 2020, you'll recall, the government of Niger imposed a blanket use of armed escorts for all movements on the whole of the territory, asserting its responsibility to ensure the security of foreigners in Niger, including humanitarians, of course. But as you can imagine, um, the measure had severe consequences on our operations. The cost of escorts had to be shared with the state, carving out significant amounts out of our programs. The number of field missions was curtailed, and a gap of understanding grew each day between authorities and the nature of the work needed to be carried out so imperatively by humanitarians and protection actors inclusively. Most importantly, the dialogue with communities and that critical insight into how they coped, so core to our work, were fast eroding. I led months of negotiation between representatives of humanita the humanitarian country team, and this includes NGOs, UN, and donors, and the government. And in May 2021, the prime minister, presiding over a national access committee, was convinced into reversing the mandatory use of escorts 
based on two things we proposed. The decentralization of decisions on security arrangements for humanitarians closer to the point of delivery, and an active promotion of realistic alternatives to armed escorts to render them truly a last resort. This was a watershed moment as it allowed us to set up and strengthen the work of regional level civilian military committees where joined up security analysis is discussed and includes a dialogue on protection risks faced by communities and what needs to be done about them. All eight regions of Niger hold regular, usually monthly, SIMCORD meetings, we call them, bringing together regional authorities, security forces, and humanitarians. The, gov the governor, of course, still oversees a security com uh, committee where decisions are made, but the SIMCORD allows for different perspectives to be shared and inform decision-making. In addition, all humanitarian actors, UN and NGOs, agreed to a notification system of field missions in a bid to promote transparency and understanding of humanitarian work and providing an opportunity to plan ahead in a bid to exploring alternatives to armed escorts, like driving in convoys or securing the area prior, during, and after field missions. An average of 1,000 missions per week are carried out through this mechanism, promoting better coordination with state security actors more regular and sustained presence of protection actors among communities, better reporting and response to protection risks, and an objective measure of the mutually reinforcing approaches by the state and by humanitarian actors to provide presence and services among communities in most need. While armed escorts have not entirely disappeared, trust between humanitarian and security actors has grown and so have efforts to pursue sustained area-based security, contributing to communities' own feeling of security. Noteworthy is that when the state security personnel are drawn from communities themselves, the level of trust and effectiveness in security also grows, a significant feature for those internally displaced persons expressing a willingness to return to their villages. Lesson number three, communities are central to access that protects. A group of NGOs, UN actors, and donors from the humanitarian country team in Niger worked on a national access strategy. This guide for humanitarian actors on the ground clearly and simply sets out pr the practical purpose behind humanitarian principles, and it helpfully explains the limits of humanitarian work. Most helpfully, perhaps, our access strategy broadens and legitimizes the range of trusted community members and structures able to improve access the locally recruited National Guard because of their deep knowledge of dynamics in and among communities, but also the savvy local women's associations and youth rights groups indirectly contributing to safe passage and presence of protection actors because of the more pedagogical way they can explain what we do and why we do it impartially or independently. Traditional leaders in Niger play an essential role in access that protects. Their legislated stature means a high degree of accountability. They are the go-to authority to arbitrate family and communal disputes, and they are highly respected for doing so fairly. And their role in protecting the most vulnerable in the community is taken very seriously. By way of illustration, there have been remarkable advances to identify, respond to, and prevent the marriage of children in Niger ahead of legislation because of the stance taken by traditional chiefs. Humanitarian actors, and protection actors in particular, cannot do their work properly without a deep understanding of community dynamics and the roles played by different community representatives. In turn, an important role is played by protection actors here, strengthening local capacities to devise community-based protection and bespoke solutions for communities themselves but also to legitimize the contributions of less visible members of community by engaging and giving them space. The end result is an all-community acceptance of humanitarian presence and diversified effort to ensure safety and protection. Now for some frank talk about the, I'm really using up all my space, right? Um, now for some frank talk about some barriers to access. If I've not articulated clearly enough the security pressure under which all this is getting done, 
you'd be forgiven for thinking that all is flawless with collaboration being so exemplary. But uh, there are significant uh, barriers that remain to access. And I'd like to raise a few of these. First, the perceived per uh, competition between the state and NGOs. Pushing back non-state armed actors imperatively requires the state not only to reestablish its presence in border areas, it requires that the state deliver and be seen to deliver those basic services needed most. Justice, health, education, food security. Humanitarian actors cannot be seen as substituting for the state, but rather be seen as part of efforts to strengthen the social contract. Here, protection actors in particular play an important role in enabling frank dialogue about protection risks and how they can best be avoided, targeting both duty bearers and rights holders. In addition, we're now robustly pursuing a localization strategy, not as a means of transferring the risks of working in volatile and remote areas in Niger, but in recognition of the unique knowledge and lo that local actors have and their techniques for reaching and engaging communities differently. Niger is the first recipient of a new and innovative funding model that many of you are supporting to support humanitarian operations in West and Central Africa. The first regionally hosted pooled fund helps us reach under, underserved locations in Niger and thus enhance humanitarian access and by channeling funding to local and national partners. Two funding envelopes have thus far been allocated, growing the number of eligible Nigerian NGOs from nine to 15. There's room and appetite for this to grow. Seeing professional national NGOs with adequate resources working alongside communities will help grow trust and the complementarity of humanitarian aid with state development act, uh, efforts. Tension point number two. I'm almost done. Regional dimensions of the conflict and cross-border coordination. The regional nature of the security crisis in the central Sahel challenges our ways of working. As non-state armed groups operate across borders, so do civilians as they are forced to flee when they're not coerced into following some armed groups through abductions, extortion, forced recruitment. Some of our programs include cross-border dimensions and some, like our recent peace building fund project with the north of Bina, are designed for cross-border impact. But cross-border programming is difficult. Measuring impact, coordinating mutually reinforcing interventions, getting actors aligned despite geography, all this remains challenging but necessary. Interestingly, we're improving coordination in that in our, at our instigation, Civilian military coordination calls have now begun between Niger and teams in Burkina Faso, Mali, Nigeria, and Chad for more joined up analysis and the start of discussion of discussing protection responses based on those variable realities of access in border areas. Finally, making diversity and tradition complementary. In this high strung securitized context, characterized by incursions driven by non-state armed groups among border communities. Security strategy is driven from the center, but local engagement is essential. Regional state authorities and local traditional chiefs represent a cornerstone in the civilian security effort. And here's the rub. The prominence given to youth and women in our responses can lead to perceptions that humanitarians are ignoring security dynamics at play and inadvertently undermining the authority required of traditional leaders and local authorities. We've done quite a bit, as I've mentioned throughout, to promote a better understanding of humanitarian principles and work, but it is critical that we further strengthen trust and partnership. The flagship initiative, for which Niger is one of four pilot countries, is such an opportunity. The more local and the more accountable humanitarian aid is, the more confident authorities are about their own people driving decisions that impact communities, particularly when traditional leaders and local representatives are engaged. The objectives pursued by the flagship initiative can, in a context where the state, and this is such a case, the state is genuinely concerned for its people, 
It can strengthen, therefore, the social contract by recognizing the valuable contribution of a mix of community actors. I hope these few reflections were helpful, at least drive some of our discussions later this afternoon. And I very much appreciate your interest, not just in the humanitarian work that's being done in Niger, but how we're doing this quite collectively and uh, with the strong leadership of a government that uh, cares for its people. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I felt I was in Niger. The description was truthful and concrete. And um, thank you for the frankness on the, the challenges, but also really the, the focus on the solutions. Uh, the, the, these lessons learned and uh, remembering, reminding us that uh, it has to be, you know, anchored in in local traditions, in uh, uh, also building on not on but also with the the local um, the local actors, civilian, military, formal, non-formal, traditional actors. I think that was really inspiring and resonating, uh, resonating for me a lot. Um, you spoke of trust and partnership again. I think these are recurring words here already. Um, we'll hear now from, um, from uh, we move to, to Northwest Syria, and uh, we'll hear online uh, from, um, from Usama Churbagi, uh, the general manager of AFAC Academy. Usama, welcome online. Thank you so much for joining us. It's quite late uh, where you are. We. Uh, we look forward to hearing your first-hand experience uh, in engaging and le leading in negotiations and engagement with uh, different interlocutors in your context, um, in particular for the, the protection of the, the civilian population. So the floor is yours. Over to you, Osama. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time, your invitation, and, and the opportunity to, to share our experience in Syria. So I am Osama Shurbaji. I am from Syria. I am pharmacist. I got my PhD in, in molecular biology from Paris 7. And I am general manager of AFAC Academy, which is a local NGO. Okay. Osama, I don't in, know if you hear Syria. us. So, yeah. uh, thanks to... You're back. That's okay. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, okay. C can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, th thanks to the support of uh, our international partners like Le Centre de Crise et de Soutien and Geneva Call, uh, AFAC has achieved significant milestone of over the past decade in Syria. We have successfully reached more than 50 conflict, affect, uh, conflict affected areas, providing IHL awareness to over than 5,000 beneficiaries, including 150 women. Additionally, we have created awareness video and distributed nearly than 18,000 booklets and flyers to promote our cause. So during these years, we had several small uh, success story which taught us a lot. For example, we, we, we participated in the negotiation with Ahrar Sham and convinced them to, to, to allow humanitarian access into besieged Kafriya and Fuwa in 2016. Uh, we succeed in withdrawing several children and, and adolescents from uh, this armed group and gave them alternative education and, uh, uh, and vocational training. Uh, we saved the lives of war prisoners from execution in Ritian in 2015 only by talking to, to the local leaders who were interested in IHL and who can we, we, we deal with, with their culture and tradition uh, uh, in Syria. But the question, uh, who, how was that realistic for us? So honestly, to achieve the better protection of uh, humanitarian space, we need to deal with, with these groups per the policy of persuasion and deterrence. So, uh, so societal pressure clarify the consequence of violating the law and accountability in a way with, with, which is entirely parallel or to encouragement and enticement showing the noble values curred, uh, carried by IHL, besides linking IHL with the cultural and religious values of the local community. So during our work, we followed up on uh, factions that underwent training and, and we studied the extent of their commitment to the provision of IHL. Uh, three of the factions that signed the Code of Conduct in Geneva were selected to inspect, 
and we conducted several interviews with leaders, soldiers, and, and uh, local council members. And we also completed uh, several questionnaire with civilians in the same area. So the results showed that most violation centered around using schools as military headquarters, interfering in humanitarian NGO works, uh, recruiting adolescents under 18, uh, theft and extortion, and uh, mistreating the prisoners. Uh, from the findings, it was evident that there is a total discreteness of uh, sexual violence, which can be attributed to two, two factors. The first one is that victims tend to conceal such incident in, in this case. And secondly, that the local culture strongly condemns and considers this act as a taboo. So uh, we had the idea to examine uh, the, the, the mindset and motivation behind this violation uh, and the factors that influence fighters to commit one type of offense over than other. So for instance, we, 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 we want to understand why a soldier may refrain from sexual abuse while engaging in acts of killing or interfering with humanitarian aid projects. So what makes people behave in the way they do? So after, after talking about with people inside Syria, we can affirm that that the, the, the people are, as Abraham Maslow affirmed, the, the people are forced to strive and struggle to achieve several needs and, and, and goals like shelter, food, production, social communication. But then in the case of the Syria war, the, the question is how people behave among themselves when they are always facing death with the lack of survival resources, a sense of loss and defeat, feeling of pain, frustration, shame, in contrast to the values that call for justice, equality, courage, generosity, freedom, and, and human respect. So the, the fighter in Syria experienced a state of dysfunction resulting to, from the inability to fulfill uh, basic needs, uh, compounded by the pressure of fear and death and a sense of disappointment towards a society that had anticipated victory. So these all factors render them very vulnerable, uh, constantly grappling with the conflict between values and need. And, and here we can see the roles of the, the, the culture and the, the local pressure of the, of the people. So if the society's culture and religious beliefs do not strongly condemn such violations, the sense of guilt may be dim diminished. And as a result, the soldier may be more inclined to, to commit the violation than others act uh, widely rejected by the society. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the conclusion is that, that the, the more we can link the eye shell with the historical and religious and societal culture examples, the more fighters' behaviors becomes closer to IHL and the humanitarian space is, is really concealed. So uh, to ensure the safety of humanitarian operation, it is crucial to address the armed groups through a combination of deterrence and persuasion measure. And it is also essential to actively engage and involve all segments of local communities, fostering a strong connection to the value of IHL so by doing so, we can create an environment that promotes respect for humanitarian principles and facilitates the delivery of aid. Thank you. For Thank you so much, Osama. I think you really brought us all back to the fundamentally human elements uh, around protection and that conversation, um, both from the perspective of, of perpetrators and, and also of the, the victims. Let's that, and thank you for being so open and, and frank on the dynamics you observe in, in your context. And that's, I think it resonates a lot with many other contexts all of us have been working in, unfortunately, but acknowledging also the very, very challenging, specific uh, challenges you are, you are facing. Um, we'll, we'll come back to you, Osama, after, and if, after we take some questions from the, from the room. But, uh, and we'll reconnect on, on the visual afterward. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Thank you.
For now, I will uh, pass the floor to, uh, to Rihan uh, Zahid from the, the CCHN, the Co Center of Competence for Humanitarian Negotiation. Um, Rihan is, uh, works for an organization, as most of you may know, who is really specialized in, uh, in humanitarian negotiations and works very closely with many uh, local also protection and humanitarian actors, not only internationals, um, and in, in crises all over the world. So, um, and, and through that, that engagement has, you really have a unique insight, I would say, on the, the challenges that protection and humanitarian actors are actually facing in, um, in their negotiation work there and their negotiation for protection uh, outcomes or results. The, Rehan, could you tell us about these challenges, your observations, um, maybe also how CCHN is supporting more the local level uh, negotiations and, um, and, and how your contribution has been um, effective you know, in terms of prin principled humanitarian action um, and for protection of civilians. Over to you, Rehan. Thank you so much, and, uh, and I join my, my colleagues in thanking thanking Norway and the core organizers for, for gathering us here to, to talk about, I think, a topic that is very central and at heart of, 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 the, of the center that we work in. And, and I'll pick up from, from the second question on, on how we support um, local level negotiations. And, and just coming out of the intervention um, that we just heard from the colleague in Syria, part of the reason that the, the CCHN was, was formed was to analyze and capture practice that is already happening in the field. So, so while we do provide support, centrality to the approach also is to learn from uh, the practice that is already happening, uh, especially at the, at the national and the local level. So, so it is not just about enhancing capacity and building it, but what can we learn from the frontline actors that day in and day out with little to no support um, are conducting these negotiations and very difficult ones at the same time, and how can we capture and analyze those practices and re-inject them across contexts, across organizations, across various different, different levels. So having said that, um, for the past uh, two years, we have been uh, investing and in researching in, in, in identifying specific challenges as they, as they pertain to to um, protection negotiations, um, and 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 the results are are not very surprising, um, but it is an affirmation and validation of, of things that we we speak about, um, and and whilst there is a confirmation on the centrality of protection, it's it's uh, it's also clear that that the concept is abstract. So depending on the mandate of uh, different entities and, and how they approach the, the subject. There is not always a consensus around what it means um, across organization, across level, across context, uh, and cultures as well. Now, the, the difficulty with this, um, it is not just a definitional academic issue, is if we cannot agree on and be clear on what it means, it's really difficult to explain to others. Uh, when we are negotiating about these 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 topics um, per se so so different messages uh, not having uh, not having a single narrative and different semantics around it is is part of the challenge and creates uh, some of the misunderstandings that then lead to 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 challenges in talking about these issues um, it's very easy when we talk about uh, negotiations, and I, and I don't use the word easy lightly. It is very, very hard to negotiate assistance in today's day and world where, where there's many different uh, groups, there are multi-parties, there's lots of uh, fractures, um, and, and there's many actors you may need to, to negotiate with to, to cover a truck a 50-kilometer distance. It is even harder. To, to talk about concepts that are, uh, that are normative in nature. Uh, and protection negotiations that are inherently normative in nature. So, so we may drive them from international law, refugee law, human rights. Um, at the local level or in the context that we are working in, they may have beliefs, value systems, uh, and different things, whether they are religious, ideological, 
that may be driving their stances on those topics as well. Uh, this is, and, and in addition to that, they might be laws, uh, whether they might be legal laws or they might be other types of traditional laws that they have, which are, which can be in contradiction uh, with 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 our frameworks as well. It is it is exceptionally challenging to negotiate and try to convince people to change their beliefs, things that 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 people have believed in for a very very long time. Uh, it is almost impossible, if I may, to to try to move the needle on on that. So it is it is a it is a it is a difficult venture, uh, which is part of the challenge. And because it is a difficult venture, there is a lot of discomfort uh, and and shyness from from frontline colleagues and negotiators to tackle some of the subjects as well. Um, and I do say this that also, especially this can be. This can be uh, out of fear of repercussions. Um, they, they are topics that are sensitive in nature. They may not be liked by counterparts. Uh, um, there might be fears that uh, actors may, humanitarian actors may be asked to leave or, 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 or other repercussions with it. For, for local and national actors, there are also very real concerns about safety and security. So while international actors um, can can withdraw. Um, national and local actors will be there in that context, so there's also considerations for personal safety and, and security there as well. Um, another, another challenge that, that comes up, unfortunately, still a lot, is, is this notion of uh, assistance, uh, not protection. Um, and, and from the first standpoint is from a, from a perspective of the authorities. Um, it is easy to, to, to accept things and sell things that are visible and have visible value uh, towards things. So, so whether it is uh, different forms of assistance, it's food aid, it's wash items, these are tangible things uh, that, that, that visibly benefit the community. The authorities have an interest in, 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 in bringing them in. Um, not always the same with, with, with protection interventions. So already from, 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 from the get-go, from an acceptance perspective, um, there, there might be the direct benefits are, are less visible. And sometimes there is also a misunderstanding and a misassociation with protection and, and, and security issues as well, which, which, is, uh, which, which is a further, further reason from, from, from uh, being shy from it. Um, and lastly, um, it is also true that within organizations as well, uh, when, we, when, when there's resource constraints, when there's prioritization, again, it is still unfortunately often that, 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 that assistance is prioritized over, over protection as well. So in, in terms of the challenges, these, these are some of the things that, that come out. Um, I think in terms of, of the response and what we've been trying to do uh, to, to further the, the dialogue and, and create opportunities for, 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 for capacity enhancement on this. Is first, there's in, in, in partnership with, with UNHCR and, and, and the Global Protection Cluster, we've, we've designed specific workshops. Uh, they're not trainings, but really uh, workshops in which experiences can be shared, uh, there can be an application which particularly deal with, with, with protection negotiations. So, so while in other workshops there may, might be less time that is spent on, on how to negotiate norms and, and normative things here, um, because it is one of, one of the difficult challenges, it, it requires a dedicated space in which there is capacity enhancement uh, for that. The second, as I had said at the, at the beginning of this intervention, is to create moments and opportunities where we can learn from each other. We can learn from each other in, 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 in safe spaces. Uh, these, are, these are extremely sensitive topics, um, but there are approaches, as, as the colleague said as well, um, there are local uh, approaches, cultural appropriate approaches in certain places that we can learn from and see if we can apply them in different places or in the same place as well. So, so we're creating these, these spaces for dialogue uh, around protection, both at the global level 
and and then in a more decentralized way at the field level, so people also don't have to resort uh, to using communication means, et cetera. So you can have smaller hubs of safe spaces where 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 people can speak more freely and have a dialogue and and learn from from each other. Um, and 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 the third and and the fourth piece is around being available for for tailored support. So as much as we build. Uh, capacity and and connect each other. There will always be challenges um, that require very tailor-made uh, responses. And given the scale and scope of the challenges that we are all faced with today, um, it requires capacity building at a larger scale. Uh, so it cannot be workshop at a time. So all of our material is open source, and we try to include it in in, in existing learning platforms. Of, of different organizations, such that it is spread as, as, as far uh, and wide as, as possible. And, and, and the last is we, we continue to document, capture practice uh, research, and, and see the, the, the lessons learned, uh, the good approaches, and, and make them available to, to, to actors, both at the local and the international level. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. I think in hindsight, what you describe as the challenges and what is required to actually do the work that Usama or Louise and your teams are actually delivering on is, uh, that shows, I mean, how much goes into succeeding and, and delivering in the way uh, the colleagues on the ground are actually um, performing. Like, so I'm trying to catch up on time, so I'll, I'll, I won't comment more. <laughs> and uh, I'll pass on the floor to Arnaud Royer from, uh, uh, in Haiti, um, our lead um, protection cluster coordinator. Uh, Arnaud, you should be online. I, are you connected? Can you hear us? Yes, I am. Can you Great. hear me? We hear you. We don't see you, but it's OK. We, we hear you, if that yes. helps with the bandwidth. Um, uh, Arno, I know yeah, I introduced you before, so over to you. Thank you. Uh, if you hear me, that's perfect, even if you cannot see me. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the, the sponsors of this panel, as well as the, uh, the Group High Protection Cluster for shedding light on this often forgotten crisis, the, this other situation of, of violence in Haiti. So uh, b before entering in the the core of the discussion about uh, access negotiation and the challenges for protection actors, I would like just to brief you on, on the, the protection situation in Haiti. Uh, since mid-July 2021, the protection situation in Haiti has dramatically deteriorated due to the alarming escalation of gang violence, mainly in the capital. Today, about 60 to 70 percent of the capital is under the control or influence of criminal gangs. In gang control areas, the population has become the direct targets of killings, disappearances, forced displacement, and brutal acts of sexual violence with a view of territorial control. Gang violence has also impacted severely the most basic economic and social rights of the population. As compared with the past decade, this has also impacted the way that humanitarian have been working because in the past, they mainly intervened in the context of natural disasters in Haiti. In 2023, according to OCHA, more than 5 to 0.1 million Haitians will be in need of humanitarian assistance. So that's the situation. Against this background, uh, humanitarian actors have been delivering assistance and been working in an extremely, extremely volatile context marked by access constraints. There are two types of access constraints. One is known as humanitarian actors do not have access to people in gang control area due to insecurity and uh, violence concerns. The other constraint is that affected people cannot move freely outside these gang control areas because they are under constant surveillance from gangs elements. So they cannot have access to even services or with challenges. Services which are outside these areas. The problem of access is likely to remain and even worsen in Haiti. One, the national police and local authorities have shown for nearly two years their incapacity to regain control of areas under the grip of gangs. 
but also the deployment of a specialized international force is yet to be materialized. Therefore, different approaches have been carried out by humanitarian actors to overcome access constraints. One is known is, of course, access negotiation. So you have UN actors, NGOs in affected areas relying on national, international personnel to develop relationship with key individuals to access gang control areas. Some also uh, of these individuals of former staff of humanitarian organization, and they facilitate access. On that front, we can say that humanitarian actors and many UN agencies had some success in July 2022 in an area called Cité Soleil, when they managed to have access and deliver assistance to thousands of people. However, from a protection risk and from a protection point of view, there are some risks associated to this approach. The risk of interference of criminal gangs in the delivery of assistance through various mechanisms that they have been created over the past years, such, such as social foundations under the control of gangs. There's another risk, which is the aggravation of the empower balance between actors in these areas. Reinforcing, on one hand, weapons bearers at the expense of powerless groups. From a protection perspective, and in addition to access negotiation, what are we implementing and what we are also proposing? Actually, what we are implementing right now in IT with protection local actors is a protection, localized protection approach. But a localization approach that goes beyond the rhetoric, a localization which reinforces locally led protection responses and goes beyond local actors as only an implementing partner. First, this approach recognizes that the overwhelming majority of humanitarian assistance is already provided by local actors. And this approach also relies on protection as well as human rights actors, who has a long tradition of working with grassroots organizations in these areas called OBE, Organization Base, and survivor, survivors groups. Over the years, a network of community-based partners have been developed to collect sensitive information and support victims in areas where very few international actors have access to. These partners are already present and live in gang con gangs control areas with a first-hand understanding and knowledge of social, political, and security dynamics among and between the gangs. What we do exactly? Uh, our main objective is to invest and empower these grassroots actors and provide them with adequate support to create their own social and political space in areas under the influence of gangs. Concretely, what one, we support and reinforce their monitoring capacity, capacity to identify protection incidents, but also to collect information regarding victims of these incidents. That's the first thing. We reinforce their monitoring capacity. Two, we have developed a case management protocol, particularly focusing on confidentiality to follow victims of protection incidents. And three, which was a real game changer of the past few weeks, we established an emergency protection fund to respond quickly to the immediate needs of victims and to ensure that no one is left behind. Because we realize over the months that hundreds of victims fall into the cracks of big program interventions. You have hundreds of people who are not benefiting for service delivery when, when they exist. So we managed to this emergency protection fund that actually provide very small amount of money to local actors, actually the capacity of this actor to respond quickly to the needs and uh, to the needs of the victims. In conclusion, this approach has two objectives. One is a way, another one is a goal, a way. It's a way to access people. And I would like to insist on that from a protection perspective in Haiti, accessing area is one thing. Accessing, accessing to people is another one. So we make this difference between accessing areas and accessing people. 
So that's the way. And the goal, by implementing a localization protection approach, actually we positively impact the power balance between gun holders and the local population in favor of the latter. And that concludes my short uh, intervention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arno. I think that was very inspiring. And also, um, we often have news on Haiti where it's not possible, it's complicated. And I think you, you illustrate here how we actually really are, are able to, um, to access people and to, to strengthen their own means uh, to access the services they need and find protection solutions uh, among and between local actors with the support of, um, of some international actors and, um, and resources. So I appreciate really your very concrete examples. Uh, Aurelien, we'll, uh, we'll pass the floor to you um, about OCHA mandate and uh, again your, your leadership and leading role in our humanitarian architecture. Uh, without further ado, over to you. Thank you, Sigurlen, and I can feel you want me to, to, to do short, so I'll do short. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I want to hear from you. Um, meaningful. <laughs> look, look, I'll go to, 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 to Ocha's role uh, briefly in a second, but, but maybe as preliminary remarks, two, two points. First, and it was said by, um, by Usama, by Arnaud, by Louise in different way, I think we need to approach this discussion with a lot of, of humility uh, and recognize that when it comes to, to, to protection and, 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 and access, local communities will always be the first responders to any crisis and will always have better access than any international uh, organization. And I think if you think about it this way, that changes fundamentally the way you approach your role in terms of humanitarian response and, and, and how you see, uh, you see uh, access uh, and, 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 and the access strategies. Uh, I, would, I would also note that uh, the, the, the flagship uh, initiative of the ERC uh, flows mainly from that kind of reflection, that uh, we need to build on what uh, people and communities uh, are doing and, 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 and asking, recognizing also that there is an added value for international organization, if only because uh, some communities are also under a lot of, of pressure from uh, uh, some parties to conflict, and, and maybe some international organizations have more uh, flexibility in that regard. Uh, the, the, the second remark, um, when it comes to access and protection, uh, I think it's very, to understand, to, to, very important to understand that to yield protection outcomes, you need um, sustained and quality access. You cannot achieve meaningful protection outcome. It's very difficult if you just send a convoy once in a while to a place, to an area, without speaking to people. You need to have really presence in the deep field. You need to be close to, to, to communities. And that's, in other words, access, accountability to population, and protection are intertwined. And in fact, accountability to, to population and access are not end in, in, in themselves. They're just means to an end, means to protection and successful uh, humanitarian response. And this is why OCHA has made uh, these two issues uh, central to its uh, strategic plan for 2023-2026. When it comes to, to, to OCHA's roles on access negotiation and access in general, first, I mean, OCHA is, um, is a service provider and, and a coordination body. We're not an operational agency. We, we're here to support other uh, organizations, and we, we fully recognize that most humanitarian organizations, if not all of them, have contacts with parties to conflict and are negotiating uh, the implementation of their programs. We are certainly not here to replace that. But what we can do uh, to support them is it's, it's help build a common situational awareness of the environments in which we, we, we operate. Who are the parties? What are some of the constraints? What are some of the considerations we need to take into account, including in terms of protection risks fa fa faced by the communities? And from there, try to build together a collective, coherent, and coordinated access approach across, across organization, if only to avoid that the actions of one organization undermine the, 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 the efforts of others or are being really uh, instrumentalized by some parties to the conflict. Um, another role for us, of course, is to, to, to help build acceptance by the parties. I mean, this is, for instance, the role of a OCHA, civil military coordination officers, is really to reach out to military actors on the ground 
and to explain what human and action is about and try to create space uh, for discussion on access and protection uh, for, for, for our partners. Uh, I think our role is also to ensure that whatever access strategies humanitarians choose, these access strategies do not create more protection risk than they are already. And I think that's often uh, overlooked in some, uh, in, in some contexts, and I think there's, there, here there's some progress to be done in terms of integrating protection in access strategies, and certainly we're happy that more and more protection clusters in the field join discussions uh, on, on access. And then the last uh, role of, 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 of OCHA is, of course, sometimes to directly engage with parties to conflict to facilitate and negotiate uh, access when our partners ask us or when there's a need. And it can be at different level. It can be at very political level that we saw in Jeddah with the ERC uh, trying to convince uh, Sudanese parties to make some progress on access. It can be at field level, like we've seen in Haiti with the development of human rights standards or, or, or in Sudan, where we're trying to develop uh, to, 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 to really uh, develop strategy that, that bring us very close to communities in, uh, in location. Uh, I was asked to think about some of the messages to, 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 to member states, to humanitarians, so maybe I will end with that. Uh, two, three things. To, to humanitarian colleagues, uh, I'm going to go back uh, to the need of really integrate better protection in uh, access strategies. And beyond that, I think it's fair to say that we humanitarians still have some work to do in terms of uh, putting protection at the center of our action. And I think the ISC review uh, on protection uh, came with very important and, and solid recommendation. And certainly we hope that with the, our ISC colleagues will make progress in the coming month uh, on the implementation of some of these. Uh, then maybe to, to member states here uh, in New York, there's two, three things that member states can do very concretely. Uh, first is use your influence to, to impress upon parties to conflict their responsibility to facilitate access. I mean, many uh, member states have contacts in one way or another with some parties to conflict, so it's important to use this political influence. Beyond that, uh, please make sure that uh, your action, your policies do not undermine engagement with parties to conflict, and certainly uh, we, we, we strongly welcome uh, Resolution 2664 that creates an exemption uh, under UN sanctions regime. We hope that uh, other exemptions will be adopted for unilateral sanctions and counterterrorism measures because this is the kind of policies that helps us in the field engage with, uh, with, we, we, with parties and communities in the, in the deep field. And beyond that, I would also call on, on donors to really adjust their policies uh, first to integrate uh, these uh, exemptions, but also to have a, a dialogue with us on risk management, whether it is security risk, but whether it is uh, aid diversion risks, uh, so we can operate uh, in really uh, complicated uh, areas and close to communities. Thank you. Thank you, Aurelien. And I'll, uh, I would add one ask, if I may, on uh, on our um, on member states donors uh, to to really also be mindful. You heard how critical the localized strategies and approach are, and the role of local actors are to actually uh, finding the solutions for the the populations, providing the protection to the the population. Um, if we have no means to actually support them, engage them, strengthen them. Um, th this is really undermining um, any efforts on protection. So your policies on localization and on support of local partners and actors, protection actors in particular, are critically important to be aligned with the, the, the discussion we have today on, on access, on protection, and enable that. Um, with that note, I will open the floor for, um, for any uh, you know, contributions, comments, and if you have questions to our speakers, feel free to address uh, them to indicate to whom you want to address your questions. Uh, we, we have limited time, so I'll, I'll take three questions and go back to our speakers before we wrap up. Uh, we'll start with, uh, with uh, Kinley from uh, Triangle, Triangle uh, Women's Organization and Women's Advocacy Coalition in Myanmar. Thank you for joining us, and over to you, Kinley. Thank you very much. So uh, I will represent uh, on behalf of the Triangle Women and Women Advocacy College in Myanmar. So access is an increasingly 
uh, severe and urgent concern in Myanmar. So due to the worsening conflict following the military coup in 2021, we have close to 2 million people are now displaced and unknown numbers of people unable to flee for the safety uh, as villages are under siege and a movement restriction imposed. So the recent cyclone Mocha has wrecked havoc in Rakhai and beyond primarily in armed conflict-related areas such as Chen, Sakai, Magui, where the resistant, a strong presence of resistant forces against the military exists. I work with the many women rights organizations on the ground across the country who are managing to provide much needed support to communities affected by the conflict. They are often overcoming huge operational challenges and also negotiating access and the de uh, delivery of support from the distribution of uh, hygiene kits to the provision of social cycle support and ensuring these reach some of the most vulnerable women and girls. So these organizations have the trust of the people. They are supported by these community and they are well positioned to provide life savings assistance, but they need flexible fundings outside the former banking system. So our banking systems are collapsed in, in the country and they need resources to strengthen security measures for their staff and they need to be able to continue to investing in the relationship that enabled their assets and impact. Uh, during the protection of civilian week, I plead that the war must not turn a blind eye to this grave injustice against the people of Myanmar. We are worthy of international assistance and protection as we have courageously exhibited our Z's commitment and resilience in the struggle for freedom and democracy. So please do not forget us. Please support us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kinde, and for being the voice also of women, women-led and women rights organization as well. Um, I think we have the permanent representation of France who wanted to take the floor. Merci et bonjour. I just would like to thank the Mission of Norway and the Global Protection Trust uh, and for organizing this important event and all the intervention we've heard, very interesting. Um, and we know that has a Secretary General report on the protection of civilian uh, just stated, recently noted, um, armed conflict across the globe continue to cause suffering of uh, to millions of civilians. Osama was intervening from Syria, and I think that the Syrian situation showed us how civilians can suffer. And despite this devastating, devastating situation, uh, humanitarian access continues to become further constrained. And we've understood from Aurelien Riflet and Rian Zaid how complicated access is and how difficult it is to negotiate those access. Therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to express uh, France's deep gratitude to all humanitarians, healthcare workers, and protection actors. Uh, my remark will focus selfishly on France's action on this, uh, because humanitarian action is a pillar of France's foreign policy. And I would like to share with you some concrete examples to illustrate our commitment. First, we will soon be holding the next national humanitarian conference in France, during which our new humanitarian strategy will be presented. Our last strategy called for the tripling of contribution in order to reach 500 million per year. In February, we will launch a new call dedicated to humanitarian innovation with a total budget of 3 million. And this initiative aims to support innovative and structural projects led by humanitarian partners in the field. We were talking about localization. And we also launched, together with Germany, the call for humanitarian action in 2019, which aimed to mobilize the international community in order to more effectively implement international humanitarian law and humanitarian principle and protect the humanitarian space. UNICEF's participation in this meeting brings me to my second point, the vulnerable situation of children in armed conflict. Uh, more than 20 
thousand abuses are committed against children every year. First of all, I would like to commend the remarkable work of UNICEF and please, Segolen, if you would convey this message to all your colleagues at UNICEF. France has made the protection of uh, children an absolute priority and will continue to advocate for robust, holistic and coordinated UN mandate on protection. We've also increased our financial support to UNICEF in 2023, with whom we have engaged in an international campaign for the universalization of, Paris of the Paris Principle and commitment on children involved with armed forces and armed groups. I also like to focus on the situation in Haiti, uh, where, to agree with Arno Hawaii, the crisis is multidimensional. We've heard the population is suffering from hunger, children are no longer going to school, and the humanitarian situation is deteriorating. I would like to pay tribute to all the actors working on the ground and reiterate our full support. We've increased our food aid to IT, and we will remain committed to facilitating humanitarian aid, and we'll call upon all the international community to do so. And finally, I think that this is, this is important because we've heard, of course, Madam Resident Coordinator, what you said about community-led negotiation, not to forget women and youth, um, whose contribution and participation must be a priority as defined in a world of peace and security and your peace and security agenda. It is also important to engage with displaced person, person with disability, so that their voice can be heard. And I will thank you. Sorry, we went a bit long. Well, thank you so much, and, and thanks for appreciating UNICEF work, but we would not be able to do anything actually on our own. It's really a collective work and, and a lot really relies on, on our local uh, part partners and, and you know, human rights activists and, and, uh, and other people. So the, um, on their behalf, thank you. Um, is there any other speaker who would like to take the floor in the room? So maybe, um, I don't know if our panelists want to react to interventions, otherwise I will give the floor to, uh, to Sam. Mm -hmm. So Samuel, uh, over to you for the concluding remarks. Thank you. All right, thank you. I, I myself am also speechless at, at really the, the, the valuable uh, contributions from our panelists. We had a, we had a world tour, uh, indeed, uh, from Niger uh, to Haiti to northwest Syria, uh, our colleague from Myanmar also sharing, and of course, the important work done at the global level, supporting all of the efforts uh, that we value and appreciate the, at the local level. Um, so sincere thanks to, once again to, to, to all of you for sharing your participate for your contributions. And, and again, as, as Rehan noted, we, we are all learning from one another, uh, and we can't emphasize that, I think, enough. Uh, we do also want to, of course, thank our co-sponsors and organizers for this. Um, permanent Missions of Norway, Ambassador Jules, uh, Belgium, France, as well as, of course, all the organizations behind it. Um, these are our allies, uh, our champions, uh, our backers uh, for all these valuable and, and integral efforts uh, toward uh, access uh, at the country level. Um, from the Global Protection Cluster, maybe I can share a few thoughts. Um, first of all, w this issue, has been one of our core priorities uh, over the last year. Um, and that has been how we can better understand how access constraints globally are impacting protection action specifically. And how can we achieve better complementarity between respective efforts around humanitarian access and protection. Uh, we've done this because we see unprecedented levels of protection needs around the world. Uh, protection needs have gone up by 42% in the last two years in terms of the number of the population in need. We've also seen a pronounced and worsening access situation in many crisis situations around the world, including a deteriorating situation in 23% of our protection clusters, including Afghanistan, Burkina Faso, Colombia, Myanmar, South Sudan, and Sudan. Uh, for the 31 active protection clusters, this is an ever-present reality that impacts our everyday work on the ground in protection. Recently in December, uh, following a series of conversations, consultations, roundtables, practitioner workshops, 
we launched a report together with OCHA entitled Access That Protects, uh, An Agenda for Change. In that report, we called for protection to be more clearly placed at the heart and at the center of access-related efforts and for all stakeholders to help take this forward. Um, not only for the delivery of goods, but for the expectation and the rightful expectation of protective actions and outcomes. Uh, in this agenda for change, we recognize two priorities. First, uh, around protection as a collective objective of access efforts, and that involves, of course, negotiation with duty bearers on protection first and foremost. And second, the second priority we identified was around sustainable and quality access for protection, meaning access that's not just one-off, that's not conditional, but investing in community capacities is part of that, but with strong backing and continued advocacy for action. Today's event rightfully shined the spotlight uh, on the local protection actors, including community-based groups, women's uh, organizations, all those that are leading the way in many of the contexts around the world. Uh, in the face of these challenges, we've seen very clearly that protection actors, local actors, they are not sitting on the sidelines. Uh, for local actors, this is not even an option to sit on the sidelines. Uh, through often very risky and behind the scenes work, protection actors at the local level, they make access a reality. They make this real. Uh, they help us reach the most vulnerable. They identify those that are victims. They provide life-saving assistance. They negotiate protection outcomes. This matches our collective vision, understanding that protection is a negotiation and that it happens through community-led protection approaches backed strongly by the international community. Uh, we heard it from our participants today uh, in terms of uh, understanding the mindset behind the violations, growing admiration for a country in terms of their practices, in terms of accessing areas, or accessing people, not just areas, identifying victims, convincing people, mediating. The power of talking is actually an underrated uh, uh, strategy for protection. Building on these insights and best practices that we've raised today from the Global Protection Cluster and during this week, which is about the protection of civilians, we'd like to share maybe just the following three final messages. First, humanitarian access must be viewed and measured from the perspective of local actors and how they and we can deliver protection outcomes. From the Global Protection Cluster, we commit to promote these efforts and call on donors and member states to support community-led protection through more direct, we've heard it, flexible, quality funding and capacity building. I think this is actually the humanitarian innovation that we're looking for is strengthening these types of efforts on the ground. Uh, we recognize the costs and the requirements of this of safely operating in high risk environments on front lines, and we understand the requirement for strong international backing for this. Investment in community-led approaches is vital, and we've seen it very, very clearly here today. It's the local actors who have the relationships, they have the trust, they have the understanding, they have the credibility to make, once again, access and access that protects. And so we must not leave them on their own, but we, of course, support them and we back them as appropriate. Second message is that protection, we've heard it, is a negotiation. It's always a negotiation. It is rarely given easily. It's rarely given freely. From the Global Protection Cluster, we are focusing our efforts on building these capacities and skills of frontline workers, like our Center for Competence and Humanitarian Negotiation is de dedicated to. We call on all stakeholders to explore more opportunities to scale these up to scale up protection-focused negotiation capacities, to identify joint agendas together with donors, with those that are on the front lines, and to increase the accountability of leadership to ensure humanitarian access negotiations start and end with protection. Third and finally, we acknowledge the importance of global reporting and accountability. 
including from the Security Council, to provide the needed political support for local efforts. From the Global Protection Cluster, we are working to strengthen and support through qualitative analysis, evidence of how protection impacts, uh, access impacts protection. And we call on all stakeholders to amplify the importance of access for protection by national and international humanitarian actors, including those in areas outside of government control. So once again, we thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we would like to, to share with you those final three messages, and we hope you take those forward and amplify them. Madam Chair, back to you. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, on that note, I really want to thank dearly uh, Kinley Usama, who are really the one on the front line, the one making it happen. Um, of course, uh, Arnaud and Louise, who are also our ambassadors and, and uh, leaders uh, on the ground. And, and many of you um, invest in trust, invest in partnership, and keep protection at the center of everything you do. Thank you. Merci. Merci.